Recording is on. Today is uh, September 26, 2021, and we will be continuing our discussion on the Desiderata Extinction Nadi. Um, updates on our contacts. So unfortunately, uh, I'll start off with uh, Spencer and Jeff. I sent them one last email. He suggested to see if they could uh, just have one last chat with us, um, but I haven't heard back, so. I'm sure a lot of you have seen the emails, but it um, doesn't seem like they're interested in working with us anymore. So we might have to find a new art artist or uh, our artistic director to, to help us with this, with the art. Yeah, that was sad. Um, but yeah, the email that Mike sent is just to ask them to do one more interview to just let everybody know their thinking and, and but I don't know if they will do it but just to try and get closure it's it's odd because they kind of dinging us for not being completely open and doxing ourselves and you know they the whole thing was the whole thing about bright axiom was absolute discretion and um I think Spencer's thinking more in terms of, you know, once the consensus reality. But I think that the world's heading in the other direction is you don't want to dox yourself and not in this coming climate. Uh, and we're not heading for a consensus reality. We, you know, the best you can hope for is a consensus delusion. But everybody's disappearing into their own delusions now. So it's, I think they, they are also disappearing into their own delusion and their their own delusion is that they can be uh, in a consensus reality where you have a tsar of truth and you you don't have any fake news and uh, but, you know, it's unrealistic we're heading for totalitarianism and psyops and so we're in this middle of this big psyop and you, you have to embrace the discord you can't you now run for this liberal idea that we can turn back the clock to the you know to a time when I don't think there, there ever was a time when everybody actually only stuck with the truth and did a consensus reality and there was no no propaganda and there was no untruth and I don't think there ever was that time so it's funny how we certainly heading into collapse and people are feeling it 
there is, it's a kind of a titanic moment where you know everybody realizes this ship is sinking and then they all go into these weird kind of modes you know this one hits the bar this one hit you know turns to jesus <laughs> this one runs to make a life raft but they're all kind of headless chickens it's i uh, i feel you know it's it's very weird weird uh, time as people start to realize things are bad and they uh, i i I'm disappointed at how how few people um, want to do anything. There's a lot of paralysis. It's my natural instincts are to try and do something, to try and fly to work against the system. I think most people they don't they don't want to. They uh, you know they want to stick their heads in the sand. Really, they want to, I guess it takes an effort of will or something. It need, needs a bit of strength, but they seem to me to be sticking their heads in the sand. So. Yeah, maybe these people will come back, but yeah, I I have a firm view about where we're headed, and that's totalitarianism. So, in a totalitarian existence, you have to think of it like the GDR or you know, Nazi Germany, or you know, living under Ceausescu, or you know, living in communist China today. You have to think of it in terms of how how do you how do you conduct yourself? And uh, I think you have to fight back, and I think you have to go underground and form secret societies and start working against the system. It seems so, so obvious to me. But I guess if you go back to like Nazi Germany when it was just starting in the 30s, and it it resembles this kind of reaction that you know in cabaret. Remember the lies of Mandela's cabaret. Well, Jeff and Spencer, you know, I could, would fit right in into that movie. And their reaction now is, you know, they they are theatre performers. And, uh, artists and stuff don't do well under totalitarian regimes, so they should stop thinking about fighting back. But anyway, we, we just, you know, we just carry on. Just carry on. What do you think, Mike? What do you think, Dan? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um... I think at this point, whoever we have, we, we, we use what we got. I mean, I think that's, that's important. I mean, we can't hope for a savior or somebody to save us. It's, we have what we have and we move forward. I think, um, I was just thinking, uh, oh, and the, the last conversation we had with, uh, Max, uh, it's very, very difficult to, to convince people, um, of what's going on regarding collapse or even uh, the flaws and the pitfalls of technology. It, it's, it does take a long time. And I just wanted to make a comment um, from getting a person from A to Z. It takes, it could take a hundred years. I mean, at this point, we don't have that much time. And I, I'd say if they can't be convinced now. It's, uh, there, there's no time so I don't know what to yeah I think I think we just have to press on at this point yeah that's my uh, that's, yeah <laughs> yeah yeah I mean I think the, the, the idea is that you you got to try and be of service to people and they're flocking to I think COVID changed a lot but you saw that thing that 57% of people between 16 and 25 now are doomers. That means the majority of kids are doomers. And they don't really know what to do or where to go. The, the system can't help them. The psychiatrists and the psychologists and the therapists, and they don't know what the hell to do. I had a, I had a therapist to me. He's a practicing therapist. And... He said, you know, should I, well, he also does uh, business consulting. <laughs> so he said, uh, you know, should he start um, telling people about doomerism and telling people, you know, maybe you should start planning, making you know, your plans for your company to incorporate 
a bit of collapse, you know, because there are all these people that are thinking, you know, well, they're going to start their own companies and roar off and get rich and <laughs> retire at 60. And we're talking these people in their 20s and 30s, and they're just not really clued in for where they're heading. And so this guy is like, he, he sees it. He's kind of 65. So he sees it all and he, he's... He doesn't know what to say. You know, what do you, as a therapist, you're supposed to just buck people up, get their self-esteem back, help them to get more positive. And he's starting to feel like a bit like a fraud because he's, he's, not, he's uh, filling these people's heads with delusions and then pushing them back into society, which is kind of what all psych psychologists really do. And psychiatrists then just make people, you know, they just give you a few uppers and just give you happy pills and then say, go get back to work. And so even they not having the Duma conversation. So in, in, with all the statistics saying that all these kids are now depressed and Dumas, I haven't seen them really say, look, we must have a few conferences on how do we address Dumas and how do we address collapse? Most of them are just carrying on and it's, you know, the old tools saying, well, you give them happy pulls and tell them to get a job. <laughs> so, like, uh, it's, I think the, the system is failing these kids and they're starting to, to realize. I think that's what COVID has done in the last year. They've started to realize that the system is, can't help them. They can't really cry to the politicians. They can't really cry to the the, the the boomers and say, you know, hey, you know, we want you to act responsibly and restore the world. They they starting to get the fact that the world is trash, and so that's um, you know, I think everybody can can offer these kids something. The fact that you know all this, <laughs> you're a bit of an adult, um, means you can help people out you know it's like there's so much you can do it seems to me i mean if you're on the titanic and you know that it really is going down um there's a lot you can do to, for people you know <laughs> just yeah you know what i mean it yeah. just seems like this you can ease I a lot agree. of pain you can help a lot of people um i mean if, so, if i've learned anything so yeah i mean i just think we have to pair up yeah. Oh, I just wanted ahead, to say, if I learned anything from joining the Desiderata, it's um, just to think things differently. I mean, being in cities, we, we have this mindset that we have to continue living like this when living in industrialized civilization is actually the problem. And the things that they try to do to fix the problem just fixes this, just tries to alleviate the symptoms. But the problem itself is still there. So psychologists say, oh, just do some uh, positive thinking. Or, and you say, no, um, work is not, we're not supposed to be working like this. This isn't how we were evolved. Driving cars from uh, you know, for hundreds of uh, kilometers, that's, that's not right. I mean, it's like thinking and then the funny thing is I, I had a conversation with a friend the other day, just addressing, I, I didn't try to convince him. I just said, have you ever thought about driving and how it's not, we weren't at first, we're not evolved to do that. Second, it takes a lot more, it, it takes up a lot of energy. And if you think about how nature does its thing, it's, it's it, nature's the most efficient at, converting energy and it just does it so uh, easily it seems like and it, for man we put so much energy and effort and at the expense of the planet just driving it to I'm mean, driving every everything into extinction so I mean I didn't go in that far but I just had him thinking in that direction and, and he said you know I, I never thought about it that way and yeah, that's when I realized, oh, okay, maybe people just need to think things a little differently, step out of their uh, city. But yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. It's, it's, uh, we can provide some, 
something to to these people. Yeah. Yeah, the, the biggest gift you can give to people is help them see that they're living in the opposite world. So everybody sees all this collapse going on and they you know, want to slip their wrists and you say, no, it's good. <laughs> they mistake all these things that sound like bad news. That, you know, well, the, the mainstream media reports them as bad news, but they're not bad news. Most of them are good news. So when you get shortages, and the shops and stuff and supply chains breaking down. That's actually good news, but they don't report it that way because, uh, you know, they, they want to keep this insanity going. But you say anything that stops the insanity is good. And so that's, that's why I posted that thing about war. Everybody thinks, oh, no, war would be terrible. I said, no, no. <laughs> we need anything that, that stops the system. Anything that breaks the system down, we're in the Hail Mary pass kind of uh, situation now, it's like anything that can just dis disrupt the trajectory we're on. So, you know, if you say like, well, you know, the, the pilot faints and cracks his head on the dashboard and people say, oh no, the pilot just fainted and crashed and say, so crashed his head on the dashboard. And you say, look, the guy's a suicide pilot, and we're, he was heading us to, towards the Twin Towers. It's good that he cracked his head on the dashboard. <laughs> so it's like, and then people's, but now we don't have a pilot. Well, that's a good thing. You don't want a you know terrorist in the cockpit. <laughs> you know, people don't get that. You know, they they see you know it's like oh we, we the plane's hijacked. We're all heading into you know the Twin Towers. Uh, oh, it's such bad news. Yeah, that is bad news. And now the pilots died. More bad news. No, that's a gift. <laughs> Put the two together. They never do. How can everything be bad news? When the, if the system is stopping, things that stop the system, uh, it doesn't matter what the cost. Look at the final costs. If we don't stop, it's, it's everything. We lose everything. Anything that changes the trajectory so that we just lose something rather than everything. Is good news. So there's there's good news all over the place, and everybody's splitting the risk. But that's the other side of um, opposite world. Is everybody has a natural instinct to say, "Oh, everybody's feeling down. The youth is down. People are depressed. You know, people are doomers. People are losing hope." And then they think, "Well, natural linear thinking is, you know, people are down, so we must fix them and bring them up." And they think, "No." You should be feeling down now. You know, you, you, you'd be insane <laughs> to feel good in this world. But they say, like, oh, no, we, we'll teach them yoga. We'll give them pharmaceuticals and, and fix them. And you say, no, there's nothing wrong with somebody that's feeling down now. There's something wrong with somebody that's feeling okay now. <laughs> They should be going around, psychiatrists and psychologists, therapists should be going around to people that are all happy now and positive about the future and say, you know, bringing them down to earth and saying, is something wrong with you? you know? Why? I feel happy. <laughs> yeah, no one should be feeling happy in this world, in this condition, okay? So there's something wrong with you. We need to help you. But instead, we have all the guys that are having a normal reaction. <laughs> it's, it's absurd. But yeah, so just pointing that out to people. I mean, there's so many people that think there's something wrong with them because they're feeling down. And you say, it's, it, we can help people to say, you should be feeling down. That's good. It's good. Good reaction. <laughs> good for you. At least you're healthy and normal. Well, now I feel better. Well, don't feel too good. <laughs> people should be grieving now. They should be in catharsis. They should be going through the seven, five or seven stages of grief, whatever you, it's nonsense, but anyway, sing it. But, the, um, you know, people should be going through grief now. Should be running around in denial and having holidays and trying to find ways to make themselves feel better. Oh boy, yeah, anyway. Anyway, so um, on that score, I, and, and yeah, the, the other thing to tell them is, the forbidden therapy that you see the reason why people feel depressed is because they're not fighting back <laughs> you don't you don't feel depressed if you're fighting back <laughs> see, 
this I'll, just t just think of all the movies you saw about the French resistance in like World War II. If you're in the French resistance fighting the Nazis, read the books about the people that did it. That was the best time of their life. It was excitement. They had parties. They lived for every moment. Sex was cheap and the love was free. It was like they were living the best life fighting. And the guys who were having the shittest time were the guys that complied with occupation, the, the, the collaborators. And so all these people are collaborators. And the, the, the mindset, the mindset I think of Spencer and Jeff is, if we collaborate, they'll be good to us. Say, no, you're the, you're the stooge. You're the jailhouse stooge. You're the jailhouse sweetheart. You're going to get it up the ass worse than anybody else. You collaborate. Don't collaborate. <laughs> about non-collaboration. Um, so, yeah, my week is still going slow. Uh, I uh, had a pretty interesting week. It was interesting talking to Max. But, uh, um, yeah, um, I'm still waiting for Blondie to get back on the, on the plan. And um, she's on holiday. So she got sick, and now she's on vacation. Uh, Fault is really busy at the moment for obvious reasons. But you know that Sky News thing from Australia where they said about cults. Um, so he asked, he asks us to do a comeback. So so Lionel and I are working um, to get a script for a, a comeback video, a <laughs> response video to that. Um, because uh, yeah, uh, he sent that to me the the thing about the you know where they're calling him a cult leader. <laughs> so, okay. so I thought okay, we can do a pretty good response because it's a big joke because it's uh, Sky News Australia and it's it's, um, it's a Rupert Murdoch outlet. So here these guys calling everybody a cult and they're sort of like, dudes, you're a cult. Rupert Murdoch is running a cult. He's a cult leader, and you work for him. <laughs> Sky News is is part of a cult. It's part of the mainstream, progressive, millennialist, you know, uh, modernist, uh, you know, kind of technophile, progressive, um, economist wet dream. And so you are part of that cult. If if you watch Sky News. And you, you know, you wet yourself and say, "Ooh, these guys are nailing it. Ooh, they're speaking the truth." Then you are part of their cult. You are a believer in their cult. And so it's just cults versus cults. They, Rupert Murdoch's cult is, you know, trying to ding this other cult. Why? Because it just goes against their cultist beliefs. But you say, well, which is the more damaging one? Rupert Murdoch's cult is heading for absolute certainty human extinction. And then this other cult saying like, we're trying to avoid it. And then they say, you know, go straight to Jim Jones in the jungle It's like, well, I mean, you know, not all cults are Jim Jones, right? It's kind of harsh to, to go straight to Jim Jones, because, you know, take for instance, the Christian cult, the Christian cult, they never mentioned the Christian cult and you know, how you know, that became a religion. So, so in case you never saw my videos, it's the academics say, the religious uh, scholars say that cults plus time equals religion. So um, Christianity is St. Paul's cult, and, and a lot of these guys are Christians. So before you start dissing other people's cults, just remember you're in one if you're a Christian. <laughs> so, and you say, well, Christianity lasted 2,000 years. It's apocalyptic. It's millennialist. It's tumorous. Um, but the you know it's still around. It's caused a lot of damage. But it, it it's and it's largely responsible for you know a lot of the trouble we in. But you can argue that it was the Enlightenment. The, the Enlightenment led to the Industrial Revolution. And you can say that the Enlightenment was a reaction against Christianity, so a counterculture or counter-cult. But still, that it's kind of rich for, for all these people to, to point fingers at everybody else's cult. 
Um, so anyway, that's that's the kind of gist of what we're going to try and get. <laughs> Script the comeback video. Um, yeah, then I'm not sure about Sophie and uh, if she's made any progress about you know getting uh, talks and that. So that uh, Greta is sh shaping up pretty nicely to be Joan of Arc. <laughs> Last Friday, you saw that. But yeah, they, there's a. It seems to me. I don't know if other people want to speak to this, but it seems to me that there's a the generational divide is growing. So that is it's 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 uh, you know, generational war, and it should be. I think that that uh, the people should the kids should start fighting. Um, and against us, against boomers, you know. But I've, I've, I've often said, you know, if these kids knew what my generation did to them, they would drag us out in the streets and kill us. And they should, they should. I would I would be overjoyed <laughs> to see them doing it. But, um, yeah, going underground is the only way. Uh, in the US, yeah, any public movement will be infiltrated by the FDI. We, yeah, exactly. Yep. In the, yep. It's now filmed uh, with a revelation about the yeah exactly yeah the the breakdown in the U.S. is the factional breakdown is quite it's quite difficult to to see um, exactly where the fault lines are but I mean the intelligence services the NSA the CIA there are about five thousand alphabet soup organizations uh, they uh, a lot of them are secret. And not even, you know, they, they come under the agriculture bill <laughs> in their budget, <laughs> in their congressional budget. But those guys have an extraordinary amount of power. So the, you know, even Schumacher said um, uh, that, you know, Trump made a huge mistake dissing the CIA because he says, you know, the intelligence services will have a, million ways to Sunday of getting back at you. <laughs> they said you don't cross them. And it's a, it's a remarkable admission on camera. But that is the way it is. Uh, the FBI is its own thing. And so the FBI was against the January 6th thing. It's clearly the Pentagon and the, uh, Alpha, the, the Alphabet Super Intelligence Organizations. They were, they were clearly at least part of them were for it. And it was an inside job. So it's a complicated landscape, but I uh, I would I think that the the way to deal with it is the way the way I, I said is you you need a home base outside the U.S. and you need to tackle it from outside. So hopefully we'll make progress on that. But it's this it's the same as the the ransomware guys and the cyber guys. They all have a safe haven in Russia. And those guys are potentially can make a lot of headway. At the moment, I think they're just you know, making money. But the the state actors and the fact that there there is a pirate base, or pirate bay in in Russia, means that state actors can actually use it and leverage it. So I think that's that's all to the good. But it's that is the model that you have to do. It's uh, if you. If you try and have an above ground organization now in America, you, you're just as good as dogs meat. They're just, there's so many ways they get you from, you know, you're tracked from your phone and they will get you with the address. They'll get you, they'll get you, you know, with banking services and all. They just tie you up in knots so you can't really move. Um, and then that's, that's if you, you know, small fry. If, you, if you're bigger and more of a name brand, they'll get you in the courts, and then you're so screwed. If you, uh, it's so hard to fight a legal battle. It's it's just it just neutralizes you, and so you can't go that route. You have to stay out of the, the thing. The, the main thing, the thing that we we really can do, and the thing that you. You, sh you should be doing thinking of later when things get really totalitarian is in essence spreading disaffection from the system. So you need a, a mindset of resistance. 
they can't really do much. If a mindset of defection and resistance sets in, that's kind of like rotten apples for them. It's, it's in the, the rot spreads. If the rot starts spreading, it can spread really quick. And I think that's what we're seeing in the youth now. So we, we went from a very big sea change in the last year, and it was from solar panels, wind farms, we must be doing you know responsible stuff for climate change, and it implied green tech. Now you can see a subtle shift. If you see Greta and those guys talking on about um, the you know Fridays for Future last Friday, now that was was very very different. They they said the the theme was um, uproot the system. I think was it. I think was the 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 battle cry for for last Friday was uproot the system. Now now that's not green tech anymore. <laughs> there's, there's no green growth. There's no green new deal. AOC is on her back, you know, caught on her back foot. So AOC and, and stuff is looking a little bit has been uh, as you know established politician stuff. It's, it's just looking a little bit like Hillary Clinton, a bit on the wrong side of the fence, kind of like, yeah, we kind of seen through this act now, and um, we want some authenticity. And so, yeah, I think uh, maybe Greta will become John of Arc. <laughs> it's what we need. <laughs> And uh, but anyway, that's the way the way to do it is uh, is to uh, is to get everybody to stop working for the system nine to five. So get get out of this mode where you go and protest at the weekends, and then you go and support the system nine to five. You must, you must uh, go into work in the play, in your workplace, and make sure that when you come out of it at the end of the day, they they are in a net deficit, and you've caused enough damage to to the system through your work without being noticed um, so if you can sabotage enough through in your work day to come out ahead where they don't know they don't even know that they you know that after you've taken your salary and you've caused them grief uh, they should be severely out of pocket so even the profits they make on your on your work should should be a net negative and if if enough people do that, then you know the system will change. But that the system's not going to change while people uh, protest against it. That's kind of supporting it. It's when they work against it, so when they they disable it. And so that's uh, you, but you see, you don't have to go out tomorrow doing that. You can just spread the idea first that you know the system is unreformable. And, and our last hope is to work against it. And that spreads, that, that can spread very fast. And uh, it is, it is. So anyway, but um, from the, yeah, undermining the yes from the outside is the only way. Any internal efforts will be sabotaged by the, uh, yeah, three letter intelligence and law enforcement agencies. Yeah, they, they, you see, but don't get into the, idea that they're all powerful. You see, if you actually work for one of these agencies, you 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 would get the exact opposite impression that, that we might on the outside. So if you, they, they feel completely overwhelmed, overworked, under-resourced, underpaid, bullied. Uh, so they, they not, they don't feel, you know, like, you know, we think of them as all powerful and surveilling us and you know getting back at us it's not like that at all it's you know basically these guys are they working for slave owners and so the slave owners don't treat them nice and the slave owners are stingy they don't shower them with gifts and stuff so they they used to do that in the states a little bit they, they used to you know if you were a cop then you would yeah, get a good salary and you could, you know, have a nice white picket fence and stuff. Um, but, you know, those neighborhoods are still around. If you in a plush neighborhood and stuff like that, you can still be one of, you know, Beverly Hills cop. But for the most part, cops now are all their 
all their pensions have been stolen by the state. <laughs> and so they can't really retire. The stuff they, they're made to do is against their own communities. Um, a vast majority of these guys are actually sympathetic to the people that actually have to prosecute and stick knees on there. So um, don't assume that this is a, a huge monolith that you can't make a dent. It's the absolute opposite. Yeah, to give you, yeah, I won't. I was going to tell you a story about South Africa, but I won't. But I, 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 I got to see the inside of the system, um, and see the inside of the police, and it was it was really shocking to see the difference of the people outside and the black people in South Africa, and how how you know utterly um, utterly impregnable the the system seemed, and how powerful cops seemed. But when you actually go and have a look at their day-to-day -day life, oh, the guys were hanging by a thread. They all, you know, had PTSD. They were all having breakdowns. <laughs> they, they, were, they, they were beleaguered as all hell. And so a lot of the, you know, back and swinging stuff is compensation for the fact that it's compensation for weakness. So a lot of the times when the public sees a massive crackdown and sees a big show of force, it's actually a show of weakness. I, I remember in South Africa, one of the one of the things that happened was just at the before apartheid ended. Then uh, Favut had this big military parade, this huge thing. I had to go and be in it, <laughs> and uh, you know it it was all on the national TV. Then it they tried to have like a May Day parade with all these tanks and huge show of force and planes going down. is all very, very impressive as a show of power. And most people were deceived by it. But you see, the only reason why they did it was, it was obviously what happened was they had a thing saying, look, we, we're on our last, <laughs> we're making our last stand. We're, going, we're just about defeated. What do we do? And then obviously somebody banged the table and said, we must have a show of force. We must show them, you know, we're still, we're still strong. We can show them <laughs> what you do. Well, we can have a parade. We'll show the tanks and the planes, and we can show them, the, you know, what will happen. <laughs> and, uh, and, of course, when you do that, you're actually admitting your weakness. And so that's, yeah, that's often what, what's happening. Often when the, the police come out against protesters in large numbers, and you think, well, how can you fight this? You say, well, how can they bring those numbers out every day? They, they are, they're on the ropes. They can't do that every day. And so, you, you know, being a bastard uh, takes its toll. Don't underestimate it. It takes its toll. So you know, you've got a guy there, you might be facing a, a riot police or something with, uh, you know, that are pretty you know, bullies, but you remember the guys have got PTSD, so um, and they pretty pretty shell shock. Um, but the the whole riot unit in you know if you saw what happened in Portland <laughs> last year, all the riot police on mass, they cashed in their chips. They couldn't take it anymore. They backed out. Now imagine if you're the mayor of that, <laughs> that city, how you shit yourself. <laughs> it's like you know it's like you've just lost. Your front line of policemen, they just defected en masse. Say, so, well, what's going to happen? The guys are going to do Molotov cocktails in City Hall. You'd be shitting yourself. You'd be like, shit, should I come into work today? Is that show weakness? But then if I come into work, maybe maybe I'll get burnt to death. <laughs> and these all these thoughts are going in through these guys' minds, and then the you know television comes on, and then they all act tough. But don't don't forget how beleaguered these guys are. It's it's very important in terms of res resilience, uh, but it it's often a case of you know push push push, and then just when they look strongest, uh, then suddenly they cave. So. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, like internal they, resistance is growing in the U.S. They hit a tipping point and. Yeah, that, that's an interesting way of putting it. Just when they're the strongest is actually the point where they're about to go down. So just because they show um, yeah, that, a force, yeah. that doesn't mean Tipping that's point. their strongest point. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you have to think of it all the time. You have to think in their shoes. So, so if they overreact and do big show force, you, you know, it's an uh, admission of desperation. They, they do know that in in some of the more enlightened mix of the word. There are may mayors and uh, governors of states that do realize that, and it's for, uh, you know, like in enlightened places like. Oregon and Washington and stuff. They, West Coast places. They 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 realize that if you come out in masses of strength, um, you make things worse. They, a lot of the time, they try to keep the police, you know, off the the active streets and let let people protest and just uh, you know even even let them do a bit of damage. But they they try to let people let off steam, even if it you know if you lose a few windows at a bank or something it's like yeah insurance pays then having you know all that that feeling bottled up and they, they realize it so yeah but uh, so yeah so yeah yeah, yeah. No, you see, not a lot of people in America know how how the system works. They they don't know about the Federal Reserve. They don't know how the currency system works. They don't know how the it's really a big debt slavery system, and they don't understand about the tyranny of the clock. So, yeah, I mean, all all these liberals think it's a joke. Oh, you're conspiracy theorist. Oh, they're farming us, and you know, it's like. I'm free. I'm not being farmed. Okay. I have free choice. I can have Coke or Pepsi. Okay. <laughs> it's like, oh, Jesus. Yeah. But uh, yeah, people are starting to, to get it now because, you know, they, they're starting to see the breakdown of the democratic system. Um, so all of this, this is to the goods. So, yeah, I mean, you knock Trump as much as you like, but Trump has done a lot of service. Uh, to to undermine well he's, he hasn't you know all the liberals say he's undermined democracy he not, didn't really undermine democracy as so much as show it up he's basically shown that it is broken and he he got to power in 2016 because of foreign powers hacking the election machines not you know info wars and social media hacking the information machines the debold machines were hacked that's how he got to power. It was almost a joke. <laughs> and so, so he knows. He knows where the, the system is broken, and he, he's shown people. But the best thing you can do is to try and make liberals lose hope. So lose, lose hope in the democrat, you know, lose hope in the system, lose hope in democracy, and you know, lose, lose hope for climate change. That that is our best hope is that everybody despairs and loses loses hope, and then what will follow after that is debt strikes, rent strikes, wildcat strikes, <laughs> and that's that's what we need. But you see, if you're feeling like the system is overwhelming and crushing, and the great reset is going to happen, and uh, we're all going to be crushed, it's not at all like that. You just put yourself again in, in the shoes of some of these totalitarians. Imagine you know exactly where things are going. We're heading for 4%, uh, 4 degrees Celsius by 2050 at least, okay? Uh, so they know what's coming. And they, you know, you can see what they're doing in China and America. They're barreling towards war. Now, a war is an easy way. And long protracted war is the traditional way you get lots of rebellious youth off the street. You draft them into the army. Even even Napoleon waited for the encore, the Ecole to graduate. So you would have his next uh, army 
that then he would take to Russia or something and decimate. So he, he would, he would each year he would take the graduation year, he would take it to Egypt where we, and leave it there to die. And then he would wait until the next graduation. When they graduated, he'd have his next soldiers to go into Russia. So they all died in the cold. And that's pretty much how it, how it worked. Even in South Africa, they, they basically, they, you know, they, they would burn out one, one, um, one generation and then they would you know wait until the graduates could be drafted into the next uh, thing so so they they need uh, the labor for war they war, war is labor intensive and so it mops up all the unemployed and so uh, all the rebels off the street so uh that's that's coming i don't see how that's avoidable i mean even if you just the internal stresses in America and the, on the southern border, uh, that's enough to to make them really militarize. So they're militarizing the police, but I mean, they'll militarize the National Guard and the, and, uh, the military of border. It's like hard to imagine how you can militarize it more. But what they can do is they can stop uh, spending so much on high tech stuff and just, you know, spend it on training personnel. So they just, China has uh, like I think uh, four million people or something in their army. The, the PLA has about four million boots on the ground, and uh, the US has about a million. But the US I think could go up to a million in with contractors and stuff. I think is the number. But they they could easily go up to four or five million to try and to try and meet them, and uh, and that's probable. I mean I I can see a draft coming. So anyway, the, the point is to prepare for these things. And you imagine now if you if you are one of these totalitarians, imagine, you know, just see all the resistance to just a small touch of pandemic before we've even started bio warfare for real. <laughs> it's kind of like a, a minor sip of what bio warfare is like. And already everybody's rioting all over the world. So imagine that you've got a pandemic you've got empty shelves bread rights and then they try and have a draft so ooh, mother of god <laughs> you don't want to be in a position of authority in america <laughs> yeah but all of this is is good and this uh, it, the system needs to come down and here it is i mean all these hippies from the 50s and 60s, 60s and 70s, they all gave up. They, they, they gave up just at the point where we might have a global revolution. So they just, again, they, they reached their tipping point too early. Yeah, so, so to, yeah, my response to that would be, um, yeah, we don't really know when all of these will happen. So it's best, if I learned anything from Visitorata, it's um, uh, Kairos and be flexible. Be, don't don't um, put yourself, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Like um, a lot of, I'd say Americans think about the bunker mentality or stocking up when they don't know if these supplies will get wiped out after one week. Uh, we don't know how it's gonna play out, when war's gonna start, or if any of these will come in an, a, an order or or if it'll happen at all. Uh, so yeah, it's just be open to whatever happens and be flexible. And I guess the other thing is like, gain skills, not uh, be more, um, mindful of your skills rather than possessions, right? Yeah, the most important prepping tool you can have is your mindset. So if you have a non-defeatist, resilient mindset, uh, it's hard to keep someone like that down. So you just have a bloody-minded bulldog, you know, terrier kind of, um, attitude 
And that, that's the, the strongest thing. I mean, it, it's all through the board. I mean, if you, if you ask people in, in hospitals and say medical care staff, and you say the guys that die from say wounds or disease or something in hospital, and guys that pull through, they'll tell you it's attitude. So some people come in there with a fighting attitude. I said, those people will, will likely defeat their illness or you know get over their wounds and stuff. But it's if you have an attitude like, you know, I ain't going to be taken down by this. It's like, I'm going to fight. I'm going to fight, fight, fight. So like, say, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do myself in. You can do me in if you want to, but I'm not while I have my strength. And those kind of uh, pugnacious people, they can survive these these kind of times. The people that die off are the people that have uh, compliant attitudes, submissive attitudes, um, defeatist attitudes. Uh, so even if you're depressed now, it doesn't. It's that's not a bad thing. Um, often depression is the precursor to. An attitude to say, you know, screw this. I'm getting off my deathbed and fighting. <laughs> so um, it's really people need to really kind of hit rock bottom and then bounce back. It's not, you know, don't don't th don't get into the mindset where you think, oh, I'm not up for this. I'm too weak. I I won't be. Uh, you know, I don't have that kind of strength of will and stuff. And say, no, you don't know. So rather go with your depression. Go, you know, hit rock bottom. Don't try and fight your depression. It's, you see, part of the reason why pugnacious people survive is they're not fighting against themselves. So they're not conflicted or divided. If you get into a thing saying like, oh, I don't have the will to fight. I'm too weak. Hugh says I should, you know, be aggressive and I'm not. And I'm not that kind of person. And you can just, you know, the wind can blow me away and stuff. And say like, Everybody got dropped. I got dropped, but uh, yes, I got dropped, and now everyone's Are you... rejoining. Whoa! <laughs> did did everyone get dropped? Yeah. Looks like it. Hold on. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I got dropped. I got. Oh, dropped. okay. Yeah. So at least it's not not my connectivity. No, it's yeah. probably some nights uh, Jitsi servers probably yeah. probably overloaded. Um, um, yeah, I, yeah, I guess we're not recording anymore. Yeah, I'll start restart recording. Hopefully, it saved the previous session. Recording is on. Recording is on. All right. Yeah, just, so just in case uh, this is, uh, just in case uh, this is the only bit of video we get, we got dropped in the, in the previous half of this meeting, and we're not really sure if anything got recorded. So if this is the only bit that gets recorded now, then that's what's happened, and apologies. But yeah, I was I was just saying that the um, you shouldn't get conflicted, so you shouldn't get conflicted against yourself and start fighting yourself and berating yourself for not being strong and and things like that. Is you're allowed to be weak. In fact, you should go and explore your ultimate weakness, and that is one of the ways of bouncing back. There's there's no law that says you have to survive. If you want to just check out you're allowed <laughs> so uh, but you know it's 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 my 
personal preference and hopefully yours to fight and and survive um, but so if you if you find that bedrock of resistance where you want to survive then that that's the key to it is is not to be too scared about hitting rock bottom uh, most most people that are real survivors they they have hit rock bottom and bounced back the people that are questionable are people that resist hitting rock bottom. So that that's an important an important point. But yeah, that's the uh, by the way the bigger topic. In case you know this is the only video we got is is how to prep and um, and so there are a number of things ways you can defeat yourself and. Uh, I resist. I mean, people have been asking me. A number of people ask me this week: "Is what you know the the timeline? When do we go extinct? When, when does collapse happen?" And so, and is it? You, you mustn't get into that because it's it's virtually impossible to tell that. It's difficult enough to tell what's going to happen. It's not impossible to tell what's going to happen, but you know there there are white swans. There are lots of white swans, and you can tell what's going to happen. Um, the white swans can. Be knocked out by black swans. There are a few black swans that might sideswipe you. But on the whole, you can tell, you know, keep on putting straws on the camel's back and eventually its back's going to break. So, you know, that's a white swan. It's just keep on being stupid, you know, run in the traffic with your eyes closed, keep on doing it. You know what's going to happen. It's a white swan. It's not a genius who, you know, don't have to be a soothsayer to see how this is going. Keep on putting CO2 up in the atmosphere. It's like, we all know what's going to happen. It's not a, you know, keep on growing the population to 10 billion when we can't support the people we have. And we know what's going to happen. It's not a genius move to figure out, you know, predict the future. This is all very obvious. But they can be a black swan. You could, you could just have a meteorite come. Them. The cleft rates in the Arctic could go off. You could have a tipping point. There's plenty of black swans that are good or bad um, for survival outcomes. But, you know, the, if you read my book, there's a good black swan in there. <laughs> so there, there, there are black swans, um, but the thing about black swans is they come on a kind of log-log time schedule. So in other words, Pareto distribution. So in, in other words, 80% of the impact will be done by 20% of the, the black swans. And 80% uh, and of swans should be white swans. Um, so it just gives you a feel for you mustn't get into the thinking and saying, and now the aliens come down. <laughs> so no, that's not a black swan that's going to happen. That's kind of white swan, a negative white swan. You know that isn't going to happen. And Jesus is not going to save you, all of those kind of things. You don't want to get into those, but uh, you don't want to beat yourself up or demoralize yourself uh, making a time schedule for white swans. So, you, you know, you will be surprised. The system is complex and it will have lots of, of twists and turn, twists and turns. So you can, you can foresee obvious things like they're going to do geoengineering. It's on the cards. They're going to do solar radiation management. It's uh, it's sort of un unavoidable, but that can string things out. So, you know, if you if you're in your thirties, solar radiation management might string the saga out for, you know, until you live to seventy five or something. You probably don't want to be living in that world. <laughs> it'll it'll be a horrible horrible world, but they can string it out. They, they, you know, don't underestimate uh, people's capacity for stretching out stupidity. Uh, and they, you know, another white one is they get into escalation in commitment. We, we, we are already deeply in an escalation of commitment to industrial society. So, so nobody wants to pull it with us, like Vietnam. If you don't know what um, escalation of commitment is, it means, you know, chasing sunk costs. So. Yeah, everybody loves civilization. All the things we achieved. We went to the moon. You know, we we made Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos. Uh, you know, surely that the Enlightenment is worth that. Um, you know, so we we love all the you know, 
penicillin and all the stuff from large hadron collider and planes and the, you know, electronics and we love all of that stuff and so we say we don't want to lose that because so much was invested in it even though it's a sunk cost and and if we carry on with it it will surely kill us all but a sunk cost is pretty much the best example is vietnam is america went into vietnam mcnamara and those guys knew they couldn't win but they couldn't bring themselves to pull out and the more you know americans that died in Vietnam, the more it became, well, we can't pull out now, and then it's an open declaration that th those people died in vain. So they make more and more people die in vain to try and avoid admitting that the people that have already died have died in vain. And so that's a kind of a catch-22 that, that we are in now. We are in that now with, with industrial civilization. It's like we, we can't say, you know, the Enlightenment, Home, Newton, Galileo, we, you know, uh, Einstein. We can't say that that's a waste, you know. James Watt and the steam engine, we can't declare it a write-off. The Wright brothers, we can't say they're a write-off. Uh, you know, so we have to say that the Statue of David is wonderful. The pyramids are wonderful. Civilization is wonderful. If we back off now, we, we, you know, our school teachers that told us how incredible this civilization is, we're basically pissing in their faces. So we can't. We have to double down on this civilization. And so, you know, it's, um, that's where we're in, escalation of commitment to a losing proposition. And, uh, and, and so it, there's, there's a very... The situation is is really illustrated well by this film clip from uh, the the 1930s. I think it's the 1930s. Uh, in America, they had dirigibles, basically the zeppelins and lighter than air ships. And you know that lighter than air travel, zeppelins and things was going to be the future. And so the, there's this great black and white movie. Um, of this American dirigible, I think the R101. Some of the R101 was British, but I, I think it was an uh, American one. And when these things came in, they would tie up on masts. They had these long masts and they would dock on the masts and then people would come out and come down the mast, uh, come out of the nose and come down the mast. But to get these things tethered to the mast, they had to have all these guys running along on the ground. Uh, and they picked up ropes to uh, to hold the dirigible in place so that they could dock it. You know, they were kind of like tugboats. So they had like three or four hundred sailors running around picking up these these ropes and using their weight to steer the dirigible. And in this one classic movie, there was a gust of wind, and the dirigible was taken up uncontrollably, and all the guys hanging on the ropes, what they were supposed to do in that point was hang on the ropes and put their weight on it to bring the dirigible down. Now, the dirigible was not coming down. It was heading for a thousand foot. And so gradually, of those 400 or so sailors, they all start to get it one by one. They're saying we have to switch from basically not hanging on this rope to bring the dirigible down, we've got to let go because otherwise we're going to take a big fall from a big height. And so, you know, one by one, people are starting to realize that in big masses, big chunks of people, that some guys just don't get it. And, and they are the really dedicated ones. And they hang on. And eventually, there were like four sailors that just, they eventually got to a height off the ground where they were going to kill themselves if they let go. So it was too late to let go. There was that passed the tipping point, right? The point of no return. And so they went up to like a thousand foot. And um, I think one guy survived. He managed to wrap the rope around. But the other two just had to hang on the rope until they lost. They uh, got too weak to hang on any longer. They lost and then made a big bomb, you know, in the in the ground. But we're kind of exactly like that now with with civilization like those sailors is is people will 
was thinking that we have to double down with our commitment to industrial civilization, particularly because it's it's very analogous to that situation. Because if you say anything about anti-serve or degrowth or you know emergency, involuntary emergency deindustrialization, in other words, ecotage on a massive scale, then uh, everybody starts to get nervous because they say, well, millions and millions of people are going to die. And you say, yeah, but if you carry on, we're all going to die. <laughs> so because people don't want to take a hit, they don't want to believe that we are really going to lose everybody. We're really going to go extinct. And that's a classic case of this, um, this dilemma that, that we're in. And so most people now are thinking we have to double down. A lot of the kids now are getting the idea. Holy shit, we've got to, we've got to cut loose. We've got to cut and run. And, uh, and so the more people that can cut and run and quicker, uh, the more that, you know, the better off we'll be, the more chance we have of people surviving. But the, um, so in, in that kind of scenario, the best, the best way to prep is not, uh, not, not stop thinking of the old mindset, try to ditch the old mindset. The old mindset is individualism. It's, um, I will get gadgets. I will outthink this. I will out defeat it. And that's the old thinking. That's the, that's the thinking that got us into trouble. So you have to start thinking in terms of mutualism, not so much getting stuff, um, but getting an attitude. Getting wisdom will do do you a lot more than a, a gun and a Bible and a tin food. So uh, yeah, people very much still in the chess playing mode of you know I'm I'm going to make it through. Um, I'm a doomer. I can see what's coming. Um, I'm going to be the one that wins the lottery and makes it through all this. Those people are not likely to, to, to win through that. They have the wrong attitude. And, and part of it is, is uh, extremism. So, so you don't want to be extremist. You don't want to, you don't want to make a big stand, right? The, the big danger in, in a cultish kind of movement. So for example, like XR um, is making a big principle stand. Uh, you almost certainly will be martyred. You, you don't want to do it. Don't don't uh, don't say you know. We you know, don't do a Chris Hedges or you know, all all these puritanical guys. This hard streak. You you have to bend, or they will break you. So it's not a survival strategy. Those guys get picked off quite soon. In fact. Yeah. And. Uh, it's it's the you, you have to think more like a Weasley rat, you know. Be a Weasley rat, you know. We're a weed species. The reason why we survive is not because we made principal stands against Thor and the weather and Poseidon. It was because we we a weed species. We we Weasley cunning survivalists. We, we're not. We, don't don't be scared to get immoral. So you know. And I don't mean like a psychopath. I mean, uh, the have an attitude like an urchin, you know, like Oliver Twist, you know, Fagin. <laughs> Gotta be a little bit more like Fagin. <laughs> and uh, don't grandstand and make big moral stands. It's pointless, pointless. But TB, did you want to say something? Does anybody want to say something about this? Because I gather it's controversial. We, they teach you to, in school not to do this. But you say, like, look, we're heading for something like Auschwitz. In Auschwitz, you have to be a rat, man. You want, you want to get through Auschwitz. You want to bring Auschwitz down. You want to survive it. And, um, and you want to make sure that you, other people survive it. So you don't want to so make, make sure that you survive it at the expense of other people. You want everybody in it to survive it, and the way is to be to be kind to the other rats, but be be a rat to the system. Yeah, I was gonna say like, um, so you you've uh, seen or read the book like Into the Wild, right? Where that guy tries to go it alone in the woods. 
yeah, you don't want to go alone because, you know, we're like social pack animals and we need that like collective knowledge to survive. So it's always good to make friends with your neighbors, I think. And then as for like the moral question, like for instance, I think it's okay to lie as long as you're not like lying to profit off of people. You see what I'm saying? Like, you know, there's some things that some people shouldn't know about you. Like, I'm not going to tell people that, you know, I'm a social hermit <laughs> and all that stuff. They don't need to know that. <laughs> yeah, you will be a wily fox. Yeah. So that, that guy into into the wild is kind of a classic case of, of how you know, individuals struggle to survive. You know, the reason why that guy died was because he got trapped on this river in in Alaska and he took refuge in a school bus and uh, the river stayed in flood and he could never afford it because it was you know, frozen. So he eventually ran out of food and died in the bus. Uh, what made it so tragic was if he just followed the river down, there was actually a bridge. <laughs> it was about a mile away. He could have actually saved himself easy. Now, you see, that kind of thing happens to an individual. But if there were more people, um, then undoubtedly some guy would have said, you know, fuck, you're a bunch of assholes. I'm, I'm going to go it alone. And he would have walked down there. Then, then he would have found the bridge and he would have come back and said, hey, guys, I found a bridge. But you see, we, we need to get out of this slave mindset. The slave mindset says, we all have to get along and stuff like that. We don't need to all get along. It's horseshit. But we need diversity. Right? We need. We need to, You don't need the, a fraternity of people that think like you, because otherwise you like that guy, that, you know, into the wild where he just stays in the bus. If you all have the same mentality, you have a stay in the bus mentality. You need one guy that says fuck a lot of you, <laughs> and one guy that doesn't fit in, and one guy that's super kind to everybody and one guy that's a doormat that that is how we survive as people so you know this you, you want to tell people you know if they do kumbaya and deep adaptation like jem bendel it's like deep adaptation where we we all you know slit each other's wrists so those guys are not going to live through Th those guys are you know before the even opening act they already half gone in with a kool-aid so they, they've already gone for the phenobarbital before the opening act. But you don't want to sit down and be friends and loving and sort of things like that. You, you want to be able to do that. You want to have the capacity to do that. It doesn't mean you walk around all day with your bleeding heart and saying we must all be comrades and love each other because it's the end times. It's like, no. <laughs> You, you want some shitheads in there, man. <laughs> you, want, you want a variety. Yeah, you got to do that. You got to so, do actual real tolerance, not this fake tolerance bullshit. <laughs> you know, like, tolerance yeah, exactly. of people's, I, you know, like tolerance of people's individual yeah. personalities. Yeah. How tolerant is Jim Bendel's cult? It's like, first of all, they're all a bunch of white, preppy, you know, cardigan-wearing intellectuals. So they're all from the same stock, right? If you go in there and you say, like, uh, start effing and cussing and say, like, you guys are a bunch of namby-pamby shits. You've got to get a spine and start fighting. They would kick you out of there so fast. So they're completely intolerant. Because basically when they say tolerance, they have this, this cartoon idea of, you know, brown people and people that have been oppressed and stuff. You know what? Brown people fucking hate you. <laughs> Although, you know, you um, talking about decolonization and that. Uh, I'll, I'll take you to Africa and you can meet a real African. You know what he'll say? You're a shit. <laughs> it's some, I, I, I tell you, I'll take a redneck, a hard-bitten redneck, Bible thumbing racist bastard to to Africa, and I'll take Jim Bendel. You know who will get on better and survive better? I'm telling you, it's the racist bastard. Because at least they'll respect him, right? They, they'll say like, "Well, he speaks his mind." And I tell you, in in general, the, the, those guys are not as racist as you as you imagine. 
a lot of it is fear and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah, you know, you. Nobody in Africa is going to respect you if you like. You know, oh, we need to decolonize and we need social justice and fairness and all of that. And it's like they're already vomiting, right? It's patronizing horseshit. It's like you know they're going to take their revenge on you if you pull that stuff in in a, in a real in a real ghetto. <laughs> so yeah, people need to wake up, man. Wake up! It's hard times are coming. Hard times coming, but it doesn't mean uh, that they, you know, these depressing, maudlin kind of times that uh, these deep adaptation people try and paint them. It's these can be the best of times and the worst of times. <laughs> That's why it says that in you know in the book. It opens with these are the best of times and the worst of times, and that, that's why it's exciting times. It's Collapse is not doom and gloom. It's not wall-to-wall -wall doom and gloom. It's in, in a lot of ways, it's life dialed up. So that you know, the gas market is dialed up. If you if you don't like life, you're not going to like collapse. Um, but a lot of guys thrive on it. You know, so a lot of and and you don't know. That's the thing. That's the thing. Is you. That's not a white swan. How you behave is unpredictable. Right. So, uh, people taken to extremists, uh, they change. They change. You, see, it, 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 you know, a lot of people say, oh, you know, the youth of today, they should have a draft and go into the military and stuff and do basic training. And uh, I doubt it. But one of the things, one of the reasons why they say that is because, you, uh, because of things like this is in the military, they'll generally take you to your limit and, and beyond. And so uh, that's an amazing experience because the first thing is uh, you underestimate everybody, vastly underestimates uh, the limit. Your, your, you know, they'll, in the military, they'll take you beyond your limit and then, well, I, I, I'm more so much more resilient than I thought, but I just don't know where the next limit really is. And so yeah, that's really a good thing to do. And then the other thing is, uh, you know, you think you know what you'll be like in these situations, and you don't, because nobody knows what they'll be like. The guys going into, say, military service and basic training, and the, the guys that fare badly, are the guys that think they know what, what they're going to be like. The people that are a little bit nervous, the people that are not so sure what they're going to be like, um, they fare better. And the reason is no one knows what they're going to be like. The guys that are, are dead sure that, oh, they're going to survive this and that, they probably won't. But those guys generally um, fare worst. And, and uh, you see, and especially, you know, you, guys that come into that situation and they're nice guys, super nice guys, super fit guys and stuff. And then when they push to the limit, they, because you, the general rule is your personality will change. So if they have a super nice personality, you say, well, that's going to change. <laughs> so it probably means that you're going to be an arsehole. And uh, it's, uh, you know, the, vice versa too. You get a real, real shithead. I saw it so many times. You get a real, real shithead. Take him to extremes, and he turns into the nicest guy. So, yeah. <laughs> so remember that when you choose your comrades, man. Uh, it's, it's like you need a mixed bag there, man, because you don't know whether you, you don't reject some guy because he's an asshole. He, he might be the best guy. He might be your, the last pal you have. <laughs> So the theme of this is uh, don't uh, make assumptions about yourself, about anybody else, or or about what's coming. You can tell in broad strokes, you know that this is going to be rough. Um, but don't get into a trap of saying uh, a, a timeline. Because there's, there's something, the minute somebody asks, 
when do you think collapse will happen? How long have we got? When will we go extinct? You know they're talking from the alien cortex, and they're talking from the wrong position. What's underlying that question is um, how they, they're playing chess, right? So what's underlying it is they're strategizing. And so they say, dude, if you don't get out of that strategizing mindset, and I mean fucking fast, you're probably not going to survive. And it, it's it's obvious when you think about it. Okay, imagine like you've just been condemned to 30 years in Angola prison, <laughs> a Ugandan prison or something. You know, Angola prison is a prison in Flor Florida, if you don't know. That's really probably one of the roughest prisons in, in America. But imagine you sentenced to one of these things and you just, you, and you, you're going to be sentenced to 30 years. And, uh, and then, um, um, and then, you go into the situation, which is a gang situation, you're probably a bit, old, uh, a bit soft for this situation. And you go in with an attitude that you're going to strategize. You're going to strategize and think your way out. You, you're going to um, think, think your way through this and you know, win by calculation you're not going to fare well. You can see it straight out, right? You you can see, imagine if you're with some hard <laughs> prisoners and that, and you're calculating all they'll, they'll see that you're calculating. You're not genuine, and they're going to give you a rough time. And so, so I just say that when, you know, don't, you, you want to check yourself from starting to get into this mode for saying, you know, so, so when, when do you think the BOE is going to happen? And, and then, you know, after that, then the clathrate gulf, and we reached a tipping point. And when do we go extinct and so on and so on? Mm, wrong attitude, wrong attitude. Um, you know, get out of that, that attitude. You, you, you've got some serious work. If you have that attitude, you have some serious work to do. And, and the very f first thing you should s start to ask yourself, is why aren't you you letting go? So you to to you know to previous things and to Gary's question last week um, is uh, the the attitude uh, is kind of a nonchalance like you know Jeff Hull and those guys were saying, but it's uh, it's a nonchalance based on uh, not not being calculating, not being vested, not being alien cortex. And in a way, it's saying not being alien cortex. Um, and then uh, your alien cortex is damn useful, but it's useful to solve the problems at hand. So in an example, like in Into the Wild, where the guy was camping in the abandoned school bus, um, you know, you want Ingenuity then, you want ingenuity to find your way over the river, to find sources of food. Um, but you don't want ingenuity like uh, we currently are, like where you, you try geoengineering and you try come up with some uh, alternative energy source or uh, artificial meat or you, know, you know, or you think like I'm, I'm going to prep and stuff. Those are all the wrong type of use of an alien cortex. Does any of that make any sense? Just yeah, it's, uh, what I'm saying? yeah, I think what you're saying is, you know, we have to create, you know, new ways of surviving, new ways of thinking, new value systems and stuff, a new culture, some, if we can get that far into the collapse, I don't know. Yeah, and uh, uh, but well, careful here. Um, the, you see, again, thinking that we need new structures and new culture, that is calculation. You see, that, that is the, the wrong kind of strategizing. So the, the main thing is to, 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 to let go, because if you, if you take hits, right? So if you lose loved ones, um, you lose ideas, ideals, you, you uh, lose bits of your culture. Um, so, like, it may be the end of science. We might be looking at the end of science. So, if you love science and 
you're a big uh, science enthusiast. You, you you've got a, you know Neil deGrasse Tyson on your T-shirt with Carl Sagan. So it's going to come as a big blow when you realize that the James Webb Telescope is probably the last view we get of the cosmos, the last deep space view. Um, the Large Hadron Collider is is very probably the last instrument for looking at very small stuff. The next scale up from that is 20 billion. I can't really imagine that coming to fruition. So it, it means that uh, the next big collider won't be built. Uh, you know, I can't see it happening when there's collapse and fiscal collapse and war and Britain. They're not going to be shelling out 20 billion to particle physicists so they can go and do atom smashes. So unless it has a military outcome or something, which it doesn't. So, so then if you're a big science enthusiast, you've got to face the fact that this is where science ends. It ends very messy. We don't know what dark energy is. We don't know what dark matter is. We don't know what flow is. We know <laughs> the, um, all of these things, are, it's, you know, it's left ununified. The standard model doesn't really work. It's, so that's as good as we got in science. And that might be enough for some people to commit suicide when they realize that that's over, that, that whole line. So you, you want to have the idea of, of losing it early so you don't you know when you you re make these realizations and they will get you though from left field right they will come in the night and you'll go oh my god i didn't know that collapse meant bloody blur and that can destroy you you can hit a bloody blur that will destroy you so you want to find those bloody blows um and give them up early. So, in other words, if you are a science guy or girl, and you um, uh, you know, you have, start thinking now of what I just said about science being over. And then, oh yeah, I think then, I understand. You're in a different world. Go on. Uh, I was gonna say, I think I understand that. What I mean is, like, when people are getting together to try to survive and collapse, you know, our relationships with each other are gonna change. Not like, you know, I'm not talking about like big grand cultural things. Like the aspect of what I'm thinking is our relationships to each other. That's the part that's the part I'm thinking about that matters the most. Yeah. Um, but the very first thing that happens in relationships is um, the division now where people are in denial about where we're headed, right? So you have to as a doomer, you have to be uh, really quite empathetic to people that are not doomers and are struggling to come to terms with the fact that that uh, collapse is much, well, we're in it. And and all the bad stuff is much, much closer than than most people realize. So you, you have to be quite forgiving of, <laughs> of people's ignorance and people's denial and just just accept that people are, are human and uh, not very few people are ready for for this but the whole reason why i'm talking about this and telling you about this is this is this is my effort to try and <laughs> make you resilience and and so uh, help you try and survive it i i really think you know that we all should try and survive it right and help other people too. Along the same track that Mike was speaking earlier about learning things from these weekly meetings, um, I think the biggest things for me are um, the movement towards uh, lessening the fear of death, lessening the fear of loss of comfort, and um, kind of, uh, yeah, slowly letting go about um what's going to happen um and just being alert to uh i think the biggest should be to become uh wily as a fox as you uh were saying earlier but um the other thing that i'm thinking about is um the actions that we can take because um there's so much surveillance and repression and censorship seems to me that 
local little um, acts would be um, what would be fruitful. And if that kind of spreads uh, and gets um, um, kind of infectious <laughs> to other communities or groups, then um, that would be um, probably a way to to survive or to resist. It's a real tonic. If, if you try it, um, it's a real tonic. It's, it really it bucks you up. <laughs> it's a real booster. You see, it, what they don't want you to know is complying with the system sucks. It drains you because the, there's cognitive dissonance, dissonance in it. It's like going into work for this company. You know that they're exploiting you. Um, they're paying you for your time and keeping your work product. I mean, that's how capitalist companies stay in profit. So there's cognitive dissonance because you're required to be a team player and be dedicated to the company all the time while you know the company is abusing you and shafting you. And so if you start to get back um, at the system, at, at the local parasites that are closest to you that are sucking your blood, it's it starts to be fun. It starts to be you can you can start to get a real buzz out of it. it be, you start to really relish it, and they're scared of that. If if that can catch on like wildfire, that that can really go viral. That people can start to enjoy <laughs> bringing the system down. You see, it it takes a lot of effort to go and sit in the road and say you know insulate Britain or something like that because. You know, th these guys are being complete obstinate assholes and not listening to you. And you're really, really fighting for a better future and not, not getting anywhere. It, you know, the, the people burn out like so quickly. But you don't burn out if you just, you know, go in and oh, fuck the system <laughs> slow you, and you don't get caught. You, you, you start to feel like a, a million dollars. <laughs> you feel really good. Yeah, like and it eventually becomes yeah. Yeah, like, you start by even, taking longer breaks and then you go from there. <laughs> well, there's like uh putting little bugs in the code that one writes, right? Yeah, well but I'll tell you the <laughs> the the most sabotage you can possibly do is by letting the executives do what they want. You see what, what happens in most American companies is that the executives are clueless fucking psychopathic idiots. And the only reason why corporations function and you know, the stock price doesn't plummet every day of the week is because there are all the rest of the employees are compensating. So, you know, the management is completely fucked up. The people, particularly in the middle tier, all the experts, the guys that have the hand on the machines, they always compensate. They steer the thing in the right direction so that there's not too much damage and stuff. And so the, that you know, compensating action, if you just withhold that, that's the most damage you can do. So it's, uh, you know, if you do exactly what the CEO wants, wants uh, the company will be on the rocks in short order. But you see, what, what happens in most, most of the, the, the companies today is uh, people will offer better advice. They'll cajole him. They'll try and steer him. They'll, you know, they'll work overtime to make sure the company that's exploiting them comes out on top and doesn't get damaged by the CEO. But... So if you just withdraw that and you do, you know, say, and or even if you really want to be devious, uh, double down on, on what the CEO says. So if the CEO says, you know, like, let's do the stupid ass thing that would bankrupt the company. And you go, yeah, but what about doing that and 150% or even 200%? And then the CEO will go, yeah. <laughs> and you go, you are you right. are so Just devilishly clever. <laughs> you are so devilishly clever. And I remember this from a previous forum too. Like, let the moronic leaders have their way and uh, 
and double down, help them along, and one will probably even get a promotion. Yeah, you have to be careful because, because they, they will look for scapegoats afterwards. <laughs> but, yeah, but if you get really good at it, uh, you can encourage them along. Uh, and basically, you can do it behind closed doors. Right. You you could uh, so so take the CR out for a drink and say I don't know how big the company is or what your position is, but take the CR out for a drink afterwards and say you know like I really liked your idea. So basically, but you should only do that, but more. And then uh, you know over a drink where nobody knows that you you even did that, and then, and then you know you're encouraging behind the scenes from uh, yeah, everybody will think. He's worse than normal. <laughs> you say, yeah, yeah, he is. Don't know why. <laughs> and then they say, did you go and have a drink with him last night? And they're like, uh, yeah, I went to try and um, reason with him and tone him down. But no, he's manic on this. <laughs> but yeah, you, yeah, people, um, saboteurs like that can, can bring down countries. <laughs> You see, the, it's the, the important, that's why it's so important to get people to uh, withdraw their loyalty because the, this, the whole rotten machine, it relies on people uh, sacrificing for it, correcting for it. It, it, it demands this, uh, it's like Morlock, it really needs service of all these uh, deluded culties. And um, so, it's you know as soon as they or it's almost as soon as they withdraw their support and worship of the machine the machine fails and it has cascading failures you see what happened with with covid you can see the supply shocks and things like that those, those can go all over the place you know that's uh, you know if so you see imagine people catch on that this system is lethal and has to end and they have this kind of fatalistic view like this system has to end doesn't matter what comes afterwards you can stop being constructive the only thing that matters is being destructive constructivism is not constructivism but being constructive and helpful and useful and positive and it, those are poison because they're keeping this machine this death machine alive but Imagine that people start withdrawing that support. It can go through areas like waves, you know, so that you get in, in other words, like supply shocks in the system. Eventually, you know, whole countries can kind of withdraw. Uh, you know, uh, you don't, <laughs> you've got to imagine a world where, where a whole country, say like Germany, just, just everybody just got the shit and, uh, and just, just, you know, it could, don't underestimate this stuff. It could happen at any time. Just imagine coming out of COP26, right? You know what's going to happen at COP26? They're all going to go, they should boycott it. But but in, in a way, it, it's better if they go and, you know, I'm, I'm saying that we should boycott cut it. Faulty and them are saying that, you know, they're going to take this boycott stand. So, so, yeah, I'm saying boycott it. But in my heart of hearts, it, it really is better if activists go to COP26, bleed their heart out, and just see more shit shoveled in their direction. More lies, shit, obfuscation, subterfuge, come out of COP26. It's because they need to be educated. They need to get to the breaking point where they go, you know, they need to come back from COP26 utterly demoralized. Say, like, these people are either psychotic the most evil people known to man, they're completely asleep, just have no conscience. Is that these people just are beyond the pale. I've had it. Say, yay! <laughs> now we got a good result from COP26. Yeah, Everybody it's came those... away saying, this is finished. Yeah, it's one of those things where, you know, despite all the statistics and evidence, you can show that we don't live in a democracy. It's like people have to get slapped by the state firsthand, like backhanded. You know, to really feel that, oh, shit, this isn't a democracy. Like most I feel like most people need that firsthand experience of the actual jackboot on their face before they say, oh, fuck this. 
yeah, yeah, see, um, a lot, you know, while these people are being exploited and milked from the system and being farmed, they don't, um, they haven't actually had enough involvement with the system to actually know um, what's going on. So they don't see the meat grinders. They don't, they don't know they're on a cattle farm because they always stay on the feedlot and they never go around to see the abattoir. But it, for example, if you're in America and you get into the legal system, go up against a rich guy in, in the legal system. So, you know, basically the legal system in America is abused for sport, for rich people. It's basically a forum for uh, rich people to just grind down poor people. That's, that's, that's all the civil litigation is. Criminal litigation is for the state to grind down the centers. But the, the civil litigation process is just for rich people to strong arm, you know, little guys um, in, into oblivion. Now, most people don't know that because they don't go to court. They, they leave off somewhere where their school teacher told them how the justice system works and how a bill goes through Congress and how you know, they have three pillars of government and how the judiciary works and, it, and how a jury works and stuff like that. So they think that there's such a thing called justice. And you know if something went wrong, you could go and petition to get your justice. Um, and the vast majority or, you know, suffer that delusion because they've never tried to exercise the justice. The first time you wind up in court, you come out the other side of that in a civil process and you'll be like, fuck, the system is just unbelievable. It's just corrupt beyond belief. It's just whether how rich you are. So if you're rich, you're basically a lord. It's a feudal society. Now you only know that when you've, you've gone, gone through the system and most people don't get close enough to fight a lawsuit. So they don't get close enough to the fire to see it, see the lawsuits and stuff and see what happens to you if you fight a lawsuit. But the first time they do, they wake up. And the same with activists. So, so the, the point of getting activists down on the street in street protests is not to change the system. It's, it's, it's to give them a rapid education into how the system works. And the first time they're sitting peacefully and doing a peaceful protest on the road and a cop comes and sprays them in the face with pepper spray, then, then they understand that that's your, normally enough. A bit of CS gas shows them that, you know, what the system is all about. So it's, a, it's really a rap, rapid education system. And so we get into the stage where people uh, will see that the system is not there for them. So, you know, COVID is great. COVID showed them. The lesson from COVID was the economy is more important than you, you little liberal shithead. It doesn't matter what your primary school teacher told you. Whatever they told you in junior school, they lied. Because <laughs> the economy is worth a hell of a lot more than you. In fact, you're worth nothing. And now that everybody can see it. <laughs> they all can see they're all thrown under the bus for the economy. So all of these things, you know, eventually, that's uh, people are getting a little education there and then and when they uh, have the moment of epiphany, uh, enough of them, then then we're in business. So, <laughs> get the word out. <laughs> get the word out, man. So, anyway. Well, that's, that's good enough for tonight, isn't it? Hopefully... I'm encouraging you to be resilient and to think in terms of resilience and to, um, to just spread a countercultural message. So, you know, shit's coming, man. You see, a large part of um, surviving stuff is, is foreknowledge. So if you, even if you go through a medical procedure or torture or some hardship, if you're told in advance, even told that it'll be a lot worse than you think, um, forewarned is forearmed, you're very much forearmed. So a large part of the pain that people are going to take and collapse is that they're not expecting it and they don't believe it. But if everybody on this call expects it and believes it, the battle's already half won.
But all right, unless anybody wants to say anything else, should we should we leave it there? Yeah, I got probably one more thing. I was just, I had a thought the other night that we should make our minds like water, you know, because water can turn to ice and mist, and it's always clear. Yeah. Yeah, just that uh, adaptability, that fluidity. Yeah, when I say that you you must be like a, a rat, I mean uh, that that kind of fluidity, that resilience is lack of pride and hoity toityness and just be malleable. Yeah. Rats are malleable, they're not proud. <laughs> Um, I have one Sorry. thing to I have one thing to say um, regarding what you said earlier at the beginning of the of the meeting. Um, I remember when I was young, when I was like 17, 18 years old, and I commuted to Manhattan to get a job. And it was the first time, first maybe first or second time I was in Manhattan. And there were people in front of me and back of me and on either side of me. And I'm like, what is this? This is crazy. How can people live like I wouldn't want to live? I mean, I've never lived in Manhattan. I've never, I never wanted to live in Manhattan. I'm like, I wouldn't want to live like this. This is crazy. I mean, I like Manhattan for the like the theater and the comedy, but and the museums, but I, I, everything's all in one place, and it shouldn't be all in one place. So, <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, the. It's only your alien cortex, I think, that really likes a big city. It, the rest of your brain is, is saying stuff like, uh, this is unnatural. So if, you, if you're if you in an elevator or a crowded tube or something like that, that's very stressful for a primate. And your, your primate brain is telling you, this is really, really shit. This is really, really shit. <laughs> and that's why everybody stands in an elevator, you know, facing the door. They don't look at each other. There's kind of protocol where you stand stiffly. Um, because an ethologist will tell you that if you put chimps in an elevator, where, as soon as the doors close, they would rip each other apart. And we still got enough chimp uh, in us that our alien cortex has to work. Even in a crowded elevator, it has to work overtime. To suppress our chimp brain and saying you'll survive you'll survive <laughs> and um, but the same in a tube is people that uh, get used to a commute they um they've got the alien cortex has got used to suppressing the rest of their brain so that it's kind of like a horse that's got used to you know hearing gunshots or getting used to getting ridden but it they've trained themselves to be in a very unnatural situation for a primate. So, yeah, our whole lives are too crowded, too complex. So a lot of, a lot of these things are simplification. So yeah, just in terms of that, then the takeaway is if you're a prepper, you're probably being a little bit too complicated. You want to be uh, less complexity, less middlemen. You don't want uh, you want as fewer people between you and your necessities. The biggest necessity, of course, being food. Yeah, yeah. And anyway, just another observation is when everybody says, you know, oh, we can't abandon civilization because millions of people are going to die. They always have in their mind a whole lot of brown people in Africa. They don't forget, the sooner all this comes down, the sooner the brown people in Africa can survive. So if you're interested in justice, unplug the West. Because if there are millions of people that die, they are the guilty party. They're the guys in Manhattan and that are relying on the system. But if, if you need the system to survive, you probably are guilty of and so it's um it's hypocritical to talk about decolonization and stuff and and uh, bringing and the particular hypocrisy is is bringing people in the global south um letting them prosper and improving their standards of living and stuff and it's like no that's all by your lethal 
Western standards, your lethal consumerist capitalist Western standards. It's like the, the worst thing you could possibly do to an indigenous person is to harness them to the global industrial system just as it's about to collapse. And that's what they're doing all over the world, saying like, well, we have to get the Piraha people in, um, in the Amazon and give, the, give them schooling and give them electricity and, you know, make sure they have access to, sh you know, Jeff Bezos and um, deliveries and stuff and consumer products and radios and phones and stuff. And say, that is not a great service to the Piraha because for 10 years ago, the Piraha were doing fine. They, they would survive. If, if, if when collapse comes, they they wouldn't probably miss a beat. They would they would just hear that uh, you know the river boats weren't coming up anymore because the fuel was unobtainable, and that they would be better off. They wouldn't get their alcohol, and uh, so so we kid ourselves that you know Africa has to be allowed to develop and stuff. It's like no, that's the crudest thing you could possibly do is just develop Africa just as you know civilization hits a wall. So it's don't ever forget that when people say, oh, no, we can't actually do an emergency deindustrialization because millions are going to die. And then you must always say the guilty ones. That's called climate justice. <laughs> Who are the ones that are going to you know, die? Well, the first ones are going to die are the ones that are reliant on the, the system and the, the ones that have the biggest carbon footprint and the ones that are consuming the most. So yeah, we can spare them. Trust me, they've got they've got all their just desserts. They've lived so high on the hog now. If they, yeah, I, I think they deserve the death penalty now. I have I have no problem with saying that, you know, people are living in Manhattan and stuff. It's like, well, sorry man. <laughs> it's a human race or you. It's like I have no problem uh, flicking the switch on guys in big cities. They are the guilty ones. Just the big cities that did it. When I look out the window here, basically there are no fucking dolphins. Why? Because the guys in the big cities came as tourists and ate all the fish hmm. that should have been fed to the dolphins. dolphins. Hmm. So I don't have a lot of sympathy with, the, with people who come, come from London and New York to come out here and just, you know, destroy the sea. It's like, well, you've done that for 20 years now. Now what? Now, death penalty? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not in favor of the, that death penalty. But if, if, you know, we have to say, well, we have to lose 20% of the people in this lifeboat. I know who I'm voting for. It's all the fucks that live in Beijing, Mexico City, Manhattan. <laughs> Those are the guys, man. You had your good times. Now take a leap, man. Walk the plank. Yeah, it, it's that. Yeah, it's that hypocrisy with the left too. They talk about imperialism, but it's like, yeah, the first thing imperialism kills, right, is the bacteria in the soil, the fish, and then the people because of the agriculture. Yeah. So victims of imperialism yeah, are more the, than just humans. Same, yeah, the same little shits that. Uh, climate justice and decolonization are also the first ones who talk about electrifying Africa. He's saying like, what do you think electrifying Africa is? It's basically colonizing them as tight as you can be in your progressive mindset. So if you don't want cultural appropriation, start with your own culture and stop exporting it to Africa. Because Africans were doing fucking well before <laughs> white people brought electricity. And if you, the last thing they need is electrification. They need you to fuck off and give them back their land so they can uh, stop Coca-Cola using their water and start using it for crops again. So, you know, fuck off with the stupid shit about developing Africa. Or, you know, oh, we need, our, you know, we need all these other poorer countries to uh, to be a, get their chance to develop because we had a chance to develop. Say, so, no, we were fucking crazy and now uh, we fucking deserve to pay. Don't harness them into our same mistake yeah they should so they should idiots. take down those fences too in africa and close those schools so those bushmen can move around more that's fucked up they fence them in there like that yeah the, 
you know, at, on out of one side of their mouth, all these fucking precious little ecologists are saying, you know, we need to preserve at least 50% of the earth because that's what the scientists do. And, and then instantly, all the indigenous people who used to be called nomadic hunter-gatherers are now suddenly called poachers getting bushmeat. So, no, that's not bushmeat. That's the stuff they get to live on sustainably, by the mm. way. <laughs> and there's like, no, we all have to be vegetarian. Those things have to be national parks. And basically, you know, they must be open to tourism. Like, boy, these ecologists ever fucked up or what? Basically, no, you got to take the fences down. you got to get the tourists out <laughs> and um, stop extracting shit. Get rid of the cell phones so, you don't, so these guys don't have a cobalt mine on top of them. Stupid ass. Your electric car comes from copper. It was mined in their backyard and poisoned them. Fucking idiots. Anyway, enough of those hypocrites. <laughs> All right. Well, that's my rant. <laughs> Should we call it a night? Call it a day. Yeah, I think so. I don't oh, think yeah. I have anything left to say. Yeah. Be resilient. <laughs> okay. Good. Well, let's let's. Just, yeah, let's let's pause and and practice letting go, because, you know, if you've mentally let go of stuff, then, while you still have it, it's kind of a bonus every day that you have something. You know, it's like you don't know what you've got till it, till it's gone. Well, if it mentally goes, then you do know what you've got and you appreciate it. So, if you give up something now mentally, every day that you still have it, you appreciate it more and are more thankful for it. And when you eventually lose it for real, then you say, "Well, I'd given up on it." Ages ago, I enjoyed a bonus period where I still had it, and you can wave it goodbye. And that, that is resilience, being able to wave goodbye to things. So everything you do, everything, nothing, bar nothing, while it still hangs around, appreciate it, but don't hang on to it. Mentally assume it's already gone. And so let's do that with everything, everything we thought we learned. If you thought you got anything out of this uh, meeting tonight, thought you learned something, think, you, think you're think you ahead, think you one up, think you stored a bit of knowledge, then chuck it out, get rid of it. Okay. So let's pause. And the way you do that is to fall still, give up any notions of acquisition, betterment, improvement, knowledge, all ignorance, because in essence, when you've given up everything, all that's left is the silence. Consciousness that you can feel now, knowledge that you are awake, and bliss of just resting in that silence. Well, give up a lot this week. <laughs> Let a lot go. <laughs> and it's very refreshing. Wonderful to cut these things loose. All right, everybody. Well, take care during the week. You too. Be thank safe. you. Take too. care. Yeah. Take, take care, care and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Enjoy. Enjoy the week. Bye. Recording has.